Welcome into the Action Network offices in New York City. I am Charlie DeCirco. We're coming to you live in the Action app and on the Action Network YouTube channel. If you're watching on that YouTube channel, please give us a like and subscribe. It really helps. We've got a loaded show today, so sit down and buckle up. It's Dinger Tuesday, so Anthony DeBundo is on to give us his favorite home run props on the diamond, while Jay Money discusses the latest in the NBA in Luka Doncic versus Steph Curry tonight. We'll also break down the Valero Texas Open with Spencer Aguiar ahead of the Masters next week. But we're going to give the people what they want, and that is starting out in the world of college basketball. And there's just three games left, four teams left. UConn, Purdue, NC State, Alabama in the semifinals. This is their preseason odds, or the pre-tournament odds, rather, to get to the Final Four. No surprise, UConn was minus money. They avoided Auburn and throttled Illinois behind a 30 to nothing run to get to their Final Four for the second straight season. And then Purdue, the revenge tour is in route they went from round of 64 loss to the final four holding tennessee off and of course nc state of virginia foul in the final seconds away from not even being here in that acc tournament now dj burns has america's hearts and alabama all gas no breaks on the offensive and taking down unc and clemson in their last two with that in mind we welcome in greg waddell my buddy to the show here Greg, we're going to do good cop, bad cop, because the people love when we disagree. And most of the time, we like to go head to head and butt heads. So we're going to start with NC State. We're going to talk about each team. You're going to give the good. I'm going to give the bad about why this team is either going to win and make a run or lose here in the semis. You'll start NC State. What do you got? Well, first off, it's been a longstanding dream of mine to be in a buddy comedy with you. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the whole goal here. So hopefully this is one step closer to that. Uh, listen, I also can't lie to the people. And when this segment was pitched to us, I was all over it. I was also like, hey, do I have to do NC State? Because <laughs> listen, this is going to be really difficult. I, I don't see how they beat Purdue, to be honest with you, okay? The, DJ Burns has to be the superstar for this team. And he's been incredible along this nine-game win streak, uh, unlike anything we've seen, right? This is UConn 2.0, yeah. Kemba Walker. The only problem is that DJ Burns isn't Kemba Walker. He's not going to play in the NBA for 15 years. And DJ Burns is going to look up seven inches and see the best center college basketball scene in 15 years. And I'm not quite sure his beautiful footwork is going to work. But with that said, for the sake of the segment, this is a <laughs> historic run. There's a lot of momentum going on. And I think momentum is a real factor. And if I were Purdue, the last thing I would want to see is a plucky underdog. Where has Purdue struggled in the last decade in the NCAA tournament? It hasn't been with one seeds and two seeds. It's been with 11 seeds that aren't supposed to be there. What a break for Matt Painter that he fumbles over and over again. Maybe there's a little bit of demons, a little bit of ghosts that the Purdue Boilermakers see. And maybe DJ Horn can be the best guard in that game and shoot NC State to victory. Yeah, I mean, this is an easy one for me to be the bad cop, the little devil on the shoulder here, because Zach Eady, I think, is going to manhandle DJ Burns. But I will say, the thing that I think will eventually strike 12 on NC State and their Cinderella slipper is going to go off and they'll turn into a pumpkin, that's with three-point regression that's been long coming. I mean, this is a team before the run started – Outside the top 200 in three-point defense. They're now 144th. So it's not even like they're inside the top 100. They got Texas Tech, Marquette, and Duke to shoot a combined less than 20% from the perimeter. Greg, me and you and three guys from the local YMCA can get on the court and probably shoot better than David Joplin and any of the other guys like Tyrese Proctor. So I just think that in the end, this is like the – NC State's the easiest team to pick off here. They're smaller than Purdue – Maybe the inconsistent guard play, but it's only a matter of time before the three-point regression comes in full force and DJ Burns, America's sweetheart, just goes down in a load of flames. So NC State's an easy one. We got to move up a little, a little bit step further. I think another team that I might have the edge here, and that's Alabama. They were the, they were the four seed, came out of that region with UNC. You're the good cop here, so give me why Alabama can make a run. Well, it was a nice segue into Alabama when you talk about how you and I could make threes. For the record, per me, since 2016, I'm a 42% shooter from three in my men's league. That's per me. Uh, Alabama has a lot of guys who are as good as, as that or a lot better. I mean, this is one of the most explosive shooting teams in the country. And the best thing you can say for Alabama, 
when they go out, if they go out in this final four, they're going to go out on their terms. They're not going to go out playing UConn's game. They're not going to go out playing Purdue's game in a potential national championship. Every game this team suits up for is played on Nate Oates and Alabama's terms. And that is a scary thing for no matter who the opponent is. When you stare across the court and you see Mark Sears in the game, he's Mm -hmm. the best guard in the country. We just saw what he did in the Elite Eight to get Alabama to this spot. He had what seemed like nine threes and they can just pour them in when they have the best ball handler in the game, surrounded by role players like Aaron Estrada and Rylan Griffin and Grant Nelson, who have been making shots along this run. I mean, they can go from down 10 to up 10 before you even blink. That's exactly what happened against Clemson. UConn, let's be honest, they've been front running because they're so good. Alabama will not be spooked getting down 10 to UConn quickly in a game because they can snap their fingers, make four threes, and be right back in it. And that's the most dangerous thing that you could see from any of these teams left in this tournament. Yeah, it's very interesting too. Latrell Whitesell most likely returning for this game. We'll see based on his condition uh, entering this week. But to counterpart you, right? I'm probably like a 20 to 25% three-point shooter. I got better inside game, if you will. And a team that doesn't have inside game is Alabama. They are horrendous. Swiss cheese defense, if you will. Last month, per Bart Torvik, 142nd in defensive efficiency. Like I said, they struggle to guard inside and defend the rim. Big men have absolutely had their way with this team. And foul trouble also comes into play. We see how many guys, Grant Nelson, Pringle, deal with foul trouble and have to rely on, you know, the third, fourth men off the Alabama bench to come up clutch. Obviously, Stevenson was able to do so against Clemson the last time out. I'm not so sure that's going to happen here, you know, guarding a guy like Donovan Klingon around the rim. I'm not sure how Alabama has an answer for him. And we're even talking, you know, UConn, how good they've been, how dominant they've been. We still haven't even seen them shoot the three ball well at all. So it's only a matter of time, I think, before... Cam Spencer starts going, Tristan Newton, Caravan get going. And I think this is another game, UConn rolls to a 20 plus point win. Uh, you know, I was the idiot that stepped in front of the Illinois train last week and Illinois just rode me to a 30 nothing run in the second half and killed me. But that is on, we're going to go to the other side of the bracket to the final four. And that's, we're going to go with Purdue. Um, Zach Eady, obviously the revenge tour round of 64. Why are they going to make this run, Greg? Well, Charlie, I got to come clean. I got to confess something to you. I'm an overthinker, a classic overthinker. I'm not going to lie. Before this show, before I came downstairs, uh, I spent about seven minutes too many picking out which hat I was going to wear for this hit, hoping that I would (laughs) pick one that impresses you. I settled on this one. I hope you think it looks nice. Here's the thing. I encourage everyone to not be like me. Don't overthink this. Zach Eadie's the best player in this sport. He's been the best player we've seen in at least a decade, people like to throw out Tyler Hansbro as the comparison. Look at the numbers in their NCAA tournament runs. I, I don't think there is a comparison. Zach, he, he's been better than Tyler Hansbro was. And oh, by the way, yes, Tyler Hansbro stormed his way to a national championship that year. But it's not just Zach Eady and his generational impact as a solo guy down low. They have surrounded Zach Eady with the number one three-point shooting team in the country. Like, let's just step back broadly and realize what a smart formula that is. They knew what they had down low, and they went out and added Lance Jones and got Fletcher Lawyer and Braden Smith to a spot where they're both 42% shooters from three or better. I don't know who stops this team offensively. I mean, they had their cold shooting night against Tennessee. They still won the game because Zach Eady's still that good. Crazy number for you. Only 10 players in NCAA tournament history have scored 120 points and recorded 65 rebounds in their tournament run. Zach Eady's the first to do it since Larry Bird. He's the first player ever to do this in just four games. Imagine what he's going to look like with two more under his belt. This team can absolutely win a national championship. Yeah, so now the chips are kind of stacked against me here because I got I got easy pickings on NC State and Alabama. Now I have to tell you why Purdue's probably going to lose. But you mentioned that three-point shooting, right? They, they are great, but that is something that we've seen the Achilles heel of this team come down to the wire last year when they lost in the first round. And now this time against Tennessee, they nearly lost because they shot 20% from three. As a guy who had Fletcher Lawyer over one and a half three-pointers made, he missed three wide open ones. So it's not even like this guy can maybe consistently make it at times. You see in the big moments, this team has been struggling at, and, and Matt Painter has some bad numbers later than the Sweet 16. So that's where they ultimately come down to is that, yes, Zach Eady's going to get his. But what happens when teams say, you know what? 
Zach Eady's going to drop 25 and 15 against us, but we're not going to let Braden Smith and we're not going to let Fletcher Lawyer get four, five, six threes. The inability to hit these threes, I think, will eventually come to spurn them. Or maybe when they get a team like UConn, who has at least Donovan Klingon to stand a fighter's chance in the low post. But you never know, right? You said earlier, maybe they turn into a pumpkin against NC State, just like they did in the round of 64 last season. So it'll be interesting to see. But I'd like our chances at getting a UConn-Purdue national championship. And we'll end right there with the Huskies. Give me why the Huskies are going to be good. I don't even think you need to spend more than 15 seconds here. Yeah, let me get my PowerPoint deck out to show you why the sun will come up tomorrow. I don't know. (laughs) UConn's the best team we've seen, like, ever. Uh, The champs stay champs. Danny Hurley's a psychopath, and he's convinced 15 young men to become serial killers with him. (laughs) They're terrifying. They have nine straight wins in this tournament by 13-plus points. No game has been close, no matter who the opponent is. Their worst player, quote-unquote worst, is probably Stefan Castle, impact box score-wise. He's a lottery pick. This team's completely... Completely loaded. Don't lie to the people, Charlie. That's what I'm going to beg you to do here. Listen, I got to say something. And so this is the only way that UConn loses. And that's what Rick Patino said. We got to have about six of their best players get COVID. I think the <laughs> flu is coming around the area. So maybe the flu strikes and you can't have Donovan Kling and Tristan Newton, Cam Spencer, Alex Caravan, Stefan Castle all not play because that's the only chance that this team has at not winning the national championship, in my opinion. But there it is. You know, I, I can't lie to the people on this one with UConn. They're that good. Uh, I, I'm in detention for Stucky for betting against them in that Elite Eight. But let's talk about the NIT. Let's, let's switch gears a little bit. We talked about the Final Four teams. The fi- There's a Final Four out in the NIT as well. And we're going to stick to that Georgia-Seton Hall game. Your best bet for the semifinals here. Yeah, I mean, anytime you have an opportunity to to bet the second greatest tournament in the greatest sport <laughs> in the world, you have to do it on a night like tonight. I'm going Seton Hall minus four and a half against Georgia. Listen, I, I think the Seton Hall team may have the loudest gripe of any team that didn't make the NCAA tournament this year. We've seen what happened with the Big East. All three of their teams made the second weekend. All three of those teams were legitimately great this season. Seton Hall beat a couple of them during the year. I think they're out for some revenge. They're out motivationally to prove that they belonged in the real field. And this is a great matchup for them against a Georgia team that gives up a bunch of offensive rebounds. They're 238th in the country at preventing offensive boards. Seton Hall's 19th in the country on their own end at generating second chance opportunities. And the one big vulnerability for Seton Hall offensively has been turnovers all season long, but Georgia doesn't turn teams over. That's not what they want to do defensively. I think this game comes down to, is Kadari Richmond the best player on the floor? Can he have his way with the Georgia guards? My strong suspicion is that he will. Four and a half, way too few points. I'm all over the Pirates tonight. We really deserve a Seton Hall, Indiana State, NIT championship. The two teams that probably should have been in but got screwed because of Cinderella's like NC State. We're going to get what the people want, and that's the six and the Pirates in the finals. We also gave the people what they want, and that was me and Greg going head-to-head. Greg Waddell, thank you so much. Have a blast with this NIT semifinals game, and I'm sure I'll be talking to you soon. Always. If you've ever wanted to try the best version of the Action app, that time is now because we're running a special offer on Action Pro. To celebrate the NCAA tournament, you can try Pro Access for just $9.99 for the first month. With Action Pro, you get our biggest betting model edges, real-time money percentages, data-driven systems, NCAA tournament player prop projections from the predictive analytics team of Sean Kerner and Nick Giffen, and lots more. Just visit actionnetwork.com slash madness to take advantage before this deal expires. That's actionnetwork.com slash madness. On to the professionals of the world, and the NBA playoff race is heating up. No, literally. We start in Miami where the Heat look to find its way out of the play-in tournament. They currently sit a game behind the Pacers as the seven seed with eight games left in hand and are three-point favorites at home against the Knicks tonight. New York sandwiched between the Cavaliers and Magic as the four seed in the East. Just one game separates that three through five pairing. How about them Houston Rockets? It seemed like Golden State would smooth sail into the play-in tournament, but the Rockets have had other plans. They are now 9-1 over their last 10 and head to Minnesota as 7.5-point underdogs. Houston remains on the outside looking in, two games back of Golden State. Minnesota, meanwhile, is the third seed and are just one game back of the number one-seeded Oklahoma City Thunder. 
Those aforementioned Warriors, though, are in play tonight in a must-watch head-to-head battle between Luka Doncic and Steph Curry. Golden State is a one-point favorite, holding on to dear life of that number 10 play-in spot. Dallas is the five seed in the West and one and a half games above the Phoenix Suns, who are looking to fight its way out of the play-in tournament. With that, we welcome in Jay Money to Green Dot Daily. Jay, let's stick to this Warriors Mavs game that I just talked about. Warriors, a slight favorite. This total, the second highest on the board with 232. Going to be a great one between Steph and Luca, and you're targeting a player prop in this matchup. Yeah, this is going to be a great game, playoff style type of game as well. Um, I don't, I don't want to bet against either one of these teams right now. I think both of them are bet on, and obviously they're facing up against each other. So I'm going to stay off the side what I usually like to pick, but I will take Luca Dunches over his nine and a half rebounds here, minus one thirty five. Uh, my guy is out there stat pad, and he's really trying to build his case uh, for the MVP. Um, for to, to win MVP, he's had 10 or more rebounds in six of his last seven games. Uh, the one game that he didn't have, he had uh, nine rebounds in that game as well. So he's also averaged 10 to uh, 10.4 rebounds over his last seven games. And me and you were just talking, um, Charlie, um, as well earlier today. And I feel like Steph to go over his points might not be a bad look. It's not something that I've bet uh, so far, but we're just talking about looks here. And we talked about the total as well. This is going to be a playoff style type of game. Both of these teams need this game really bad. I'm not sure that total should be as high as 232. here. I think we're going to see some defense here, but I do think Steph over his points is a really good look. And I've noticed Luca's like making it a point to get at least 10 rebounds. He's not coming out of this game until he gets 10 rebounds. So I will rock with Luca, And I do think honorable mentions would be under 232 on this game and Steph to go over his 26 and a half points right you mentioned Steph to go over that mark too just this is a high intensity playoff style like game on TNT prime time so you're going to get the most out of these guys and you mentioned Luka Doncic and the, st- and the MVP stat padding potential he's second in the race at five to one behind the Joker who's a heavy favorite you think there's any chance at all that Luka is able to uh, upend Joker or is he uh, just kind of trying to stat pad and get his way close well, I'd love to see him get it, to be honest with you. Like, just me personally, just the way I feel, I would hate to see uh, a center. I know it's positionless basketball, but I would hate to see the center position win four straight MVPs. Like, <laughs> um, I, I uh, Michael Jordan never won uh, three straight MVPs. LeBron James, Kobe Bryant as well. You see what I'm saying? So I know Larry Bird has, but that was like a different time in the NBA. So I really wish that Luka would get it. He has been the preseason favorite to win MVP the last couple seasons. But um, with Jokic still being that heavy of a favorite, we we usually don't see a guy that's like minus a thousand, minus seven, minus seven hundred, uh, uh, lose it. So um, I know that the Nuggets have been balling, and unless Jokic chooses to let his friend, his good friend Luca, get it, like as far as like <laughs> sit out a couple games, I don't think it's gonna happen. I, personally, I feel like Luca should get it, but person, what I personally feel and what I actually think is gonna happen is a little bit different there. So um, I just, I still think that it's Jokic's um, uh, MVP to lose. Yeah, Nikola Jokic minus 700 to win the MVP right now. Just eight games left. Feels like maybe the margin is uh, ever so growing and they can't catch up. But let's take a look at tonight's game on the Buck side of things. Another best bet. We have to get uh, a play on on a side or a total this time from you, Jay. Bucks, Wizards spread around 13. Where are you looking on this one? Yeah, I couldn't talk anyone off laying the points here with the books, but I am going to take their team total over 120 and a half. And this is something I think that we can make some money with going forward here. When you hear the players come out and say, I always listen to the players interviews because they're really telling you the mindset of the team and how they want to play going forward. And Giannis says, we're playing way too stagnant right now. We have to get back to uh, playing bus basketball, pushing the pace. And then they went out there and scored 122 points versus the Atlanta Hawks and the game went over as well. So I always like to listen to the players. They've also owned the Wizards in their last uh, five matchups. They're 5-0 and uh, straight up and they've averaged 130.6 points per game uh, in their last fa- five matchups versus the Wizards. I think they're going to go out here and put up 130 once again whether they cover the spread or not. So uh, I'm going to take the, the Bucks team total over 120.5 in this one and the Wizards obviously won't have a ton of paint protection here as well. I think guys like Giannis, Bobby Portis, and Brooke Lopez could do whatever the hell they want in the paint in this one. Plenty of second chance points, uh, plenty of fast break points here versus a bad Wizards defense here. So Bucks team total over 120 and a half and if you like the bucks land 13 i'm not going to talk to y'all would you consider Giannis is over you mentioned that he can get anything he wants right around 33 and a half 32 and a half 
I'd rather take his PRA because I think it's a game where he could mess around and go for 20 rebounds as well. So 34 and a half is a little, is kind of high. And it could, obviously, you worry about the blowout potential as well in right. this particular game. So um, I would probably go ahead and take like his PRA over or uh, points and rebounds. That way you, because I really expect him to live on the boards here tonight. No Dame Dollar tonight, but Jay Money is here and racking up the cash, hopefully on the Milwaukee Bucks team total over tonight. Jay Money, thanks so much and best of luck on the action. Yo, anytime. Let's go Luca and let's go Bucks. Hey everybody, it's Joe Delera, and I've got a couple of my favorite plays for this Tuesday NBA slate. Let's start off with the spread pick. I'm going to be taking the Los Angeles Clippers minus three against the Sacramento Kings. Look, the Clippers are finally kind of getting healthy here, and they've really injected Russell Westbrook back into the bench unit, and that's dramatically helped their depth overall. On the flip side, when we look at what the Sacramento Kings are dealing with, they're dealing with a season-ending injury to Kevin Herter, and Malik Monk is going to be out for the next couple of weeks. While it seems like they'll probably lean on the starters a bit more, the problem is that when we look at where they're going further onto the bench, Harrison Barnes, Davion Mitchell, two players that probably are going to be taking a lot more of the minutes from Herter and Monk, given the fact that they're missing time, they have minus seven and minus 9.9 .9 point differentials on the course of the season. As both of these teams are really fighting for playoff positioning, I'm going to be trusting the healthy Clippers compared to the Kings who are playing with a depleted squad. Give me the Clippers minus three. For my next play, we're looking at Donovan Mitchell over five and a half first quarter points. So I like the spot here. He gets another revenge game against the Utah Jazz, and I expect him to clear his full game prop of 21 and a half, but I prefer to target him in the first quarter, given the fact that there might be some blowout potential without Laurie Markkinen, Jordan Clarkson, and John Collins. On the season, he's exceeded five and a half first quarter points in 71% of games and is averaging 7.6 points per game in the first quarter. Uh, and when he's played the Utah Jazz, as his former team, he's had 11 and 12 points in the first quarter in his career. I like him to exceed five and a half first quarter points. For my final play, we're looking at Stephen Curry over eight and a half rebounds plus assists. So the Warriors obviously fighting for their playoff lives, and I think that the Warriors are going to have to lean on Curry a bit more in this matchup against the Dallas Mavericks. His RA line is set at eight and a half, and he's actually exceeded this mark in all 13 games against the Mavericks dating back to January of 2022. So there's some playoff games mixed in there, but in the eight regular season games, he's averaging 7.9 assists and 5.6 rebounds. He's just been really tremendous in this spot. Now with Chris Paul kind of moving to the bench, there's a little bit more facilitating upside for Steph Curry. I'm trusting the 100% hit rate over the past few seasons, along with the fact that in the 18 games since the All-Star break, he's averaging nine RA and has exceeded this line in 10 of 18 games. So to recap, my three favorite plays for today's Tuesday NBA slate are the Clippers minus three, Donovan Mitchell over five and a half first quarter points, and Stephen Curry over eight and a half rebounds plus assists. Best of luck on your wagers today and enjoy the rest of your Tuesdays. And over to the diamond and it's Dinger Tuesday. Happy holidays, everybody. I'm joined by Anthony DeBundo, our home run expert here. And just a reminder for fans and betters at home, FanDuel runs a Dinger Tuesday every week on Tuesdays. You can place a bet of $25 on any player to hit a home run. And in that game, irrelevant of your pick, you'll get $5 back per home run hit, maxing out back at that $25 wager. Anthony, I want to ask you every year, Dinger Tuesdays kind of changed their rules and approach to everything. So I'm curious how you're looking at this season altogether. Yeah, I mean, so the promo, this is year four now, Dinger Tuesday. It started way back in 2021 uh, in the summer. And it, it used to be that you could bet any game and you would get the money back uh, in your FanDuel account. Now they've started to limit kind of the volume of which you can play it and still get positive expected value. And so when you look at 2021, 2022, there were no limits. You could play every single game on the board. And, you know, I often would have 13, 14 bets a night uh, on Tuesdays. And, you know, you just turn on MLB home run notifications and wait for one of your guys to, to hit a dong. Mm -hmm. But it changed last year where they limited the amount of money you're able to get back in the bonus to 50. And, and most players, not all, some players are still not limited, but mo most players are limited to 25 this year. So if you figure that there's about 2.4 homers per game, 
you only want to play about two to three games for the promo to still be plus EV because if you're betting over that, you're no longer getting the protection of the money back for the home runs hit. That's what makes such a fun promo. Uh, so you do have to kind of limit it this year. So it is scaled back. Uh, still a fun way to spend your Tuesday nights watching baseball uh, and still have a couple picks I love for tonight uh, that I'm writing a column on and uh, excited to get into. Yeah, especially in the dog days of summer, what's better than sitting down and just hoping for your guy to go yard when there's nothing else on TV? So let's get right into it, Anthony. Your favorite home run prop of this Tuesday slate. Yeah, I like Christian Yelich, plus 480 against Minnesota. Louis Varlin starting for the Twins. I like Varlin generally but he does have a home run problem. 1.4 homers per nine in 2022 uh, as a mix of a starter and a reliever. And then last season, he allowed 16 home runs in six in 68 innings. And he's a mainly fastball cutter guy. Decent fastball, throws pretty hard, although his stuff doesn't quite play up to the same level when he's asked to be a starter. He's right around league average stuff in terms of stuff plus. But Yelich is an elite fastball hitter. Slugged 590 against them last year. And one encouraging thing about Yelich thus far in the early season, he has already barreled two balls and has a higher launch angle. He has been showing signs of lifting the ball more. And the one thing with Yelich is that he hits the ball hard, but generally hits too many ground balls. So when Yelich is lifting the ball, he's a really impressive power hitter. So at plus 480, I like Christian Yelich. One player I looked at was Jake Bowers, but again, there's just some platoon risk that if the Twins go to a lefty reliever, they may pinch hit for Bowers. Whereas with Yelich, I know I'm getting four to five plate appearances every night in the heart of the Milwaukee lineup. Love this look here. I personally took Yelich's over one and a half total bases. You know, you mentioned Varlin and his uh, issues with giving up the long ball. Bottom 10% of all pitchers in barrel rate, giving up a lot of hard hit rate last season for the Twins. Definitely a pitcher to keep an eye on. But I'm going to move to the Astros-Blue Jays game. We saw a no-hitter last night. I think the ball is going to fly a little bit more with Barrios and Valdez on the mound. And I'm targeting Jordan Alvarez at plus 250. You're giving out a four or five to one. I'm going to go a little bit chalky here, giving out Jordan to have a day. Jose Barrios, he's prone to the long ball, about 1.25 home runs per nine on average. And he's in the 36th percentile in barrel rate last season, which was improved. And, you know, you look at his prior numbers, they're even higher barrel rate wise. And I think there's no reason to doubt Jordan. You and I were talking off script, off screen about it. He has just a 13% strikeout rate, so it's not like his plate appearances are all for not. He's got a 586 expected slugging on balls in play, yet is hitting 118 on those balls in play. So in a game where Barrios is prone to the long ball, prone to giving up some big hits, and the Blue Jays' bullpen, no Jordan Romano, Eric Swanson, willing to take a shot here on Jordan to finally get a home run on the board. Speaking of boards, Anthony, go back to that whiteboard. Give me your next bull or next home run prop of the game. You're targeting the Yankees and Blue uh, Diamondbacks. Yeah, one thing that's nice about Jordan, he's also a lead against lefties as well. So even if the Jays throw a lefty at him, you feel good about Alvarez's chances. I'm going to go with Juan Soto, plus 470. He's been a revelation in New York. And, and if you had a criticism of Juan Soto in the past, it was that he's too patient and he hits too many ground balls. Well, Soto's lifting the ball more now this year than he did last year again very early on in the season but some encouraging signs with his ability to uh elevate the ball and then the second thing and i think the biggest thing for his power potential soto's got an elite eye one of the best in baseball always takes walks great at bats but he's increased his swing rate on pitches in the zone by almost eight percent and that's a huge upgrade for him as somebody who wants to tap into more of that power that he has. As much as great as great as it is, as he has OBPs over 400, he can hit more homers. He has 40 home run raw power potential. The question is, can he tap into it? And I think as he's swinging more, he's going to. And so I think at plus 470 against Zach Gallen, who has seen a noticeable decline in velocity and stuff plus – uh, all of his pitches, we saw his problems uh, even in the playoffs last year with limiting the home run ball uh, as he kind of wore down. He hasn't really found his top stuff yet. So uh, I do like Soto to Homer here at plus 470. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I have this background here of all the baseball bats and gloves just for this segment in particular. That's the only reason why they're here. But Anthony DeBundo, you do a column every week on Dinger Tuesdays. I believe you have three coming out, another home run pick that the viewers can go watch and read, right? Yeah, uh, there's a third pick and I'm not going to give it away. You got to go read the column, which is up now at actionnetwork.com. But let's just say there's a major impact of wind in one of the games in Chicago today. Uh, and I'm tying, uh, eyeing a hitter in one of those games because I think he's uh, a pretty good price, uh, better than we should be getting given his talent. 
So you have to go to the action network.com to go check out Anthony's column. But before you go, Anthony, you know, move dingers aside. We still need a best bet on the diamond tonight. You're sticking in that Yankees D backs game though. Yeah. I'm gonna go with over nine minus one Oh five in Arizona and New York. Uh, the roof is open in Arizona tonight. It was closed yesterday. That is an increase in the run scoring environment there. The ball's been really flying in Arizona this uh, first week. Some of that might've had to do with the Rockies pitching, but I have major question marks about both starters in this game. Look, Nestor Cortez was awesome in 2022 and he really limited the home run ball, which is something that he projected to have a problem with. Well, last year with the ball, you know, being a little livelier, he had that home run problem come back. And I think he's just going to continue to have that issue uh, as he progresses here. His cutter, which is his best pitch, did not grade out well by the metrics or look great in his first outing against Houston. He really struggled through five innings, you know, ended up being okay in terms of final line, but it wasn't a sharp outing. And I mentioned Gowan a minute ago. He's had major problems through 243 innings last year, looked fatigued toward the end of the playoffs had just a nine to seven strikeout to walk ratio in spring training. And then in his first outing, just two strikeouts. So really some concerning stuff with Gallon. Uh, did not look as sharp. Didn't have the same stuff we expect from him. And look, I don't mind betting overs right now. Overs in MLB this year, 42, 22, and two, going over by 1.5 runs per game. The return on investment, 24.9%. It's not the baseballs. They're flying just as normal as they did last year, but it's the bullpens, bullpen ERA near historic highs. Sean Zarello and I were discussing this on payoff pitch today. We think that there is an element of this pitch clock. Maybe they shaved another two seconds off for relievers and for anytime there's runners on base and the career, you know, history of baseball. This is the lowest strand rate in history through a week, uh, which is crazy given that the quality of stuff in the, re in the bullpens is as good as ever. So you're seeing high fastball velocity, yet fewer strikeouts, more walks, uh, and more hits with runners on base. I think that's all a pattern of just getting adjusted to this new pitch clock. And we've seen a lot, a lot of bullpen implosions. So always a chance yeah. for some late scoring here down on the starters. Uh, I think there'll be runs in this one. They don't have to tell me twice about bullpen implosions. I know them all too well over the first week. I am curious though, before we let you go, you mentioned how hot the overs are running because of the bullpens. Is this something that you think will eventually regress? Is it the books maybe making uh, you know, a run or two higher on the totals and just have been late to adjust? Or what do you see all together on this front? Yeah, I do think there is an adjustment period and you kind of have to watch it closely. If you watch anecdotally, like there are certain pitchers that seem to be uh, rushing up against the clock and how that manifests itself. There's the snowball effect of, you know, there's already runners on, on high stress pitches. Uh, you're struggling to not only just get the ball over the plate, but if you're trying to force balls over the plate, now you're in the middle of the zone and hitters are teeing off. Uh, it really tips the balance toward hitters. Those extra two seconds make a difference. And, uh, you know, it's just crazy to see the strand rate. 69% right now, the lowest year on record is 71-1. So we're 2%. It doesn't seem like a lot, but that's an extra like 5%, 10% to the run environment. Uh, so it's a huge swing when you have all these extra hits with runners on and extra walks as well. There you have it. Anthony DeBundo. You can hear him more on the Payoff Pitch podcast, which is out now on Spotify. Also, his Dinger Tuesday column is on the Action Network website for that third prop. Anthony, thanks so much for joining. Have a great Dinger Tuesday. Thanks, Charlie. And just a reminder to North Carolina residents, sports betting is now live and there are some awesome registration offers out there. Make sure to check out the link in the description or go to actionnetwork.com for specific offer codes. Over to the links and here are the five favorites in the Valero Texas Open, which gets underway on Thursday. Rory McIlroy, the favorite at 10 to one, but my eyes dart down to Corey Connors, the defending champ at this event. He sits fifth at 25 to one to lift the trophy. Something to keep an eye on. He has only two wins on the PGA Tour both of which have happened at the Valero Texas Open. With that in mind, we welcome in Spencer Aguiar. And stop me if you've heard this before, but he is fresh off an outright winner. Steven Yeager, 50 to 1, fends off Scotty Scheffler in the Houston. Spencer, congratulations. But as we say, congrats and on to the next one. This week, we had the Valero Texas Open, and it's a precursor to the Masters, which is now just one week away. And I want to ask you, is there anything different when you're looking at this field and handicapping this event specifically, knowing what's on the line next week, whether it's motivation or look ahead spots that you could take advantage of? You know, Charlie, I think it's always challenging to know the exact reasoning behind why someone is here and how much of a true tune-up it's going to be for them. But 
I always go into these events under the mentality that if they're playing the event, they're here to win. I don't know how much that's going to necessarily help some of these names deeper down the board when you're trying to right. find win equity. I also think it comes down to what perspective we're talking about for the players competing in the Valero this week. Like, I run my model over two years for stats. It's 10 tournaments for form. That means that no golfer is going to necessarily see a massive shift in their expected outlook for next week uh, just because of one tournament when you're trying to handicap it for Augusta. I do think some of the poor form, if you do miss the cut, will weigh, but... It's an interesting course at TPC San Antonio, and you know I'll talk about it a lot this week on Action Network, whether it's on Links and Locks, and we dive deeper into the course there. But there are some similar traits that you're looking for. It's the distance that you get here. It's the aggressive nature. It's the around the green game. Like those three factors trending in a positive direction is what I would be looking for at like the most basic level of what the players are producing. But you know I do want to add Charlie before we move on to what my outright pick is. For me, one of my crowning jewels in this space is probably like the thing that really got me notoriety to begin with is Corey Connors Monday qualified for this tournament in 2019. Uh, my model is very cautious with how aggressive it gets with some of these approaches. And uh, I had Corey Connors number one as a Monday qualifier at 250 to one that tournament. It's the biggest outright ticket that I've ever hit in golf. So um, it, this tournament has a nice feel for me and hopefully we can continue it here this week. So let's continue it this week. You mentioned Corey Connors. He had the two wins here at uh, in, in, at the Valero Texas Open. And you're, and Scotty Scheffler is not playing in this one. That's, I think, kind of notable because he's always, the way that he's in form right now is absolutely on fire. But you're actually taking a different outright, not among these top five favorites that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I think you can tune into any golf show this week and hear how players must be good with their short game. You're going to have to hit a large percentage of greens in regulation to find success at this tournament. But I thought the hidden perspective came down to how you were able to score on the challenging par four locations and what kind of production you created on the difficult par five. So all four par fives generated a diminished birdie or better percentage because of their length. It often then turns them into a three shot chance of hitting the green. My model picked up on that trend. You're going to need a general aggression and a willingness to attack from long distance. That helped to propel a handful of our recent winners at this course when we dive into it over the years. So we talked about Corey Connors. He's won twice by ranking in the top 10 in this field for overall aggression, par five aggression, and aggression rate. Jordan Spieth carried a very similar trajectory during his win. He placed number one for birdie or better aggression. I tried to find that blueprint this week. I always remodel and recalculate my model to fit the course specific nature of the event that we're playing. That landed me on Matthew Fitzpatrick at 28 to one. When we talk about all those aggression categories that I just read off, he was the only player in this field to land inside of the top 15 for each one of those marks that I talked about. My model is not usually this bullish on Fitzpatrick. There's always this problematic approach return that I get, but I do think the projected windy conditions do help to emphasize his scrambling nature. And then you get this reduced iron proximity because of that win from everybody in the field. So he carried all of that momentum in my sheet. He ranks second win combining the harder par fours and five holes into one grade. That would place behind only the favorite Rory McIlroy. Very natural answer there. He also landed as only one of five players to rank in the top 20 of this field when I ran this individually for par three scoring, par four scoring, and par five scoring. So that just takes each location, recalculates in my model of what I think the anticipated score is going to be. Very similar outlook of the top names on the board that you would expect. It's Rory McIlroy. It's L Ludwig Oberg. It's Colin Morikawa. Um, it's Matthew Fitzpatrick. And then you really want to get funky Charlie with a long shot wager down this board. And we want to start talking about dart throws. The other name that fit that mix was Nate Lashley at 200 to one. I think there's a lot of different ways that you can consider playing him. And he's one of these golfers coming into this week with a lot of form here with back-to-back -back quality finishes at the players in last week. You don't have to convince me to take a long shot. Anytime I hear Spencer Aguiar likes that play, I'm going to be on board. I want to stick on Matt Fitzpatrick real quick and just ask you a question in general. Obviously, you mentioned how well he performs in your model. Do you also look to take top 10s, 20s, or, or whatever it is when it comes to placement finishes with a guy like Fitzpatrick when you have him on your outright? I, I think it's player specific on it. Um, it okay. It's one of like the arguments I was making the other day when we even look at a player like Nate Lashley. And 
And I think it, it matters what, what kind of a golfer we're talking about and what their exact upside and safety marks are. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about Fitzpatrick at the top of the board, the only legitimate way, because you end up running into too much exposure, would be Fitzpatrick as a top five or a top 10. And I think that's certainly a route you can consider. For a name like Lashley, because there's so much boom or bust potential in his profile, I think a lot of people look at it and always consider like, oh, the safer markets are the way to go. But because he has such a high ceiling and such a low floor, I normally like to reduce my risk total. So it's a player specific outlook that I'm taking in all of these spots. But right. yeah, I, I am always trying to get as much exposure as I can on the players that I'm more bullish on than the market. Swing for the fences with Lashley or maybe get a little top five or 10 with Fitzpatrick as well. But Spencer, we can't let you go without your favorite bet of the entire tournament. Let's hear it. I come on this show quite a bit, Charlie, whether it's with you or Maria and I mentioned these highly volatile boomer bust sort of plays to where I always talk about, for me, I'm trying to find a fade worthy candidate to take on in a matchup. I avoid these star versus star battles. I'm trying to dip into these matchups where I have a ton of miscut equity that's going to come into play. And that's why I like these tournaments that have a cut. You get here with 156 players and you really can start highlighting some of that miscut potential. I think it's a weird board this week because. You know, I think the last three times I've come on with Maria, they've all hit and it's all been these spots where two of them, it's gone miscut, miscut. And that's, I think, another very likely route that could occur here just because my model is not that high on Patrick Rogers if we're getting technical here. But Patrick Rogers minus 110 over Lee Hodges this week. Hodges has this profile that's full of questionable returns. He's 120th for weighted scoring, 134 fourth when faced with longer courses, which could be the ultimate downside factor here. He's 133rd for expected strokes gain total, 101st for scrambling. Like you don't want that profile when you get that answer over and over again of outside of the top 100. The miscut equity comes into play. And I, and I really think we get this matchup here priced the way it is to begin the week. Just because of what we've seen recently from Hodges, he's put together a handful of quality performances. He has made a few cuts in a row. You have those three top 35s if we date this back uh, over the last four weeks of events. But I think that sometimes the market moves too much off of short-term data. And I'm always trying to run things for long-term data from a course-specific outlook. And Rogers carries that upside potential of what I'm looking for in a lot of these areas. He has the distance. He has the around the green game. Hodges has none of that that we just talked about. So <laughs> I think it's a spot where where if Rodgers can put the pieces together and they both end up making the cut, there's a higher ceiling that comes into play. But there's also that overall safety. And while neither one of them necessarily have exactly what I would want to see on that front, Hodges has bottom 10, 15 potential in this field. So I'll take on that profile every single time I can. Finding the guy that you can fade the best. And hopefully you mentioned you won all these games with Maria. Hopefully I'm not the one to chalk your best bet streak here on Green Dot Daily. But Spencer Aguiar, thank you so much for joining Green Dot Daily. You can find him on Twitter at T Off Sports for coverage on this Valero Texas Open and the Masters next week. Spencer, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. I appreciate it. And just a reminder that any pick that we give out on the show, including the ones you've heard from Spencer just now, you can easily reference by following Green Dot Daily in the Action app. We keep track so you don't have to. And that's going to be all for Green Dot Daily. I'm Charlie DeSterco. Thanks so much for watching. And just a reminder, if you're on our YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe. It really helps. Green Dot Daily will be back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern on the Action app and YouTube channel. Y'all have a great rest of your day.